Hi everyone and welcome to today's presentation. My name is John Paul and I'm part of the marketing team here at Tableau. So with us today we have three very special presenters. Uh, we have Andy Cockgreave, Steve Wex Wexler and Jeffrey Schaefer who will be showcasing some of the best content from their exciting new book, The Big Book of Dashboards. Before we begin, I just have a couple of announcements. First, um, we are going to be holding a question and answer session after the presentation. So if you have any questions, uh, please just leave them in the Q&A box as we go along. Uh, secondly, um, everyone who's attending this webinar um, will enter our random prize draw to win one of 15 copies um, of their brand new book. Um, the 15 winners will receive an email confirmation with further information um, within the next week. Um, so that's all from me. Um, so with that, um, let's get the presentation started. Hi, this is Steve Wexler, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by my fellow authors, Jeffrey Schaefer and Andy Cotgreave. Um, and I'd like to start by showing you a lovely picture of Andy Cotgreave's bookshelf, and that is the Big Book of Dashboards, and which represents roughly 30 years a combined, uh, combined experience of the three of us distilled into a 448-page book, and now in the next hour we are going to attempt to distill that into a one-hour webinar. So pay attention, we're going to be covering a lot of stuff. Very briefly, I am the founder of Data Revelations, a consultancy that helps organizations better understand and visualize their data. I've been a Tableau Zen Masters since 2013, and I very briefly want to share three of my best, smartest decisions and accomplishments. First, I married my wife. Second, I had the good sense to compete in the inaugural Iron Biz Championship six years ago when there were far fewer Tableau badasses out there. Some of the things I'm seeing people do for the uh, uh, feeder competition are absolutely amazing. And I had the good sense to ask Jeff and Andy to collaborate on this book. I cannot think of two people more qualified or that would be better collaborators, and it's been a thrill to work with them. And with that, I'd like to pass things over to Andy. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I will also agree. It was a pleasure working with you, Steve and Jeff. Thank you for asking me. Uh, my name is Andy Cockgreen. I'm technical evangelist at Tableau. Uh, I've been at Tableau for nearly seven years, and I purchased Tableau ten years ago as a frustrated analyst at the University of Oxford. Uh, I get to travel the world and help enthuse people about Tableau's mission. Uh, I guess accomplishments for me, I invented the bar chart tooltip, uh, a nice little hack for making tooltips with charts. I organized the first Tableau user group in EMEA, and tangentially, DataViz led to me becoming a part-time magician. Uh, no magic, no magic tricks in this uh, webinar, but if you do see me at a conference, feel free to ask me and uh, we'll see what I can do. Also available for parties, weddings and bar mitzvahs. All right, with that, I'll hand you over to our final co-author, Mr. Jeffrey Schaefer. Thank you, Andy. My name is Jeff Schaefer. I'm the Vice President of Information Technology and Analytics at Unifund, a company in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the U.S. I am also the Adjunct Professor at the University of Cincinnati, where I've been teaching data visualization for the last six years. Uh, I'm also one of the Tableau Zen Masters for the last uh, few years and uh, co-author on the book. Um, I'd have to say my, my, my authors were a pain to deal with. They, they all say it was a wonderful collaboration, but I'm just kidding. They, they were great to work with. <clears throat> to get started today, I thought I would uh, kick off fundamentally we're talking about dashboards. What is a dashboard? Uh, and in this case, uh, you know, we see a lot of business dashboards that, that come off like this, this picture of, of this car. Um, we had to define a dashboard for purposes of our book, and I think what you'll find is we have a very broad definition. A, a dashboard is a visual display of data used to monitor conditions and or facilitate understanding. And some of the dashboards in our book, you may or may not agree that, that they are dashboards. At the end of the day, we, we, we weren't too concerned about that definition in the sense that we think that we can learn from all of the scenarios in our book. We have 28 scenarios, and the way that we outline those scenarios were, were learnings uh, to, to be able to model after. 
And so that brings me uh, to what I want to open with today, which is a quote from the book Steal Like an Artist. Nobody is born with a style or voice. We don't come out of the womb knowing who we are. In the beginning, we learn by pretending to be our heroes. We learn by copying. We're talking about practice here, not plagiarism. Plagiarism is trying to pass someone else's work off as your own. Copying is about reverse engineering. It's like a mechanic taking apart a car to see how it works. We learn to write by copying down the alphabet. Musicians learn to play by practicing scales. Painters learn to paint by reproducing masterpieces. Copy your heroes, the people you love, the people you're inspired by, the people that you want to be. The reason you copy your heroes and their style is so that you might somehow get a glimpse into their minds. That's what you really want to internalize their way of looking at the world. And what we're gonna show you today is a bit of that reverse engineering. We're going to identify some key elements and show you some design ideas for building your dashboards. So, Thinking about design, if we go to the graphic design world and bring some of those elements to dashboard design, one of the fundamental concepts in graphic design is designing to a grid. Now, the grid doesn't have to be laid out very uh, specifically on a dashboard to the, that you're showing the lines and the borders and, and all of those things. But as, as an example, here's a font e experiment where I was working with a graphic designer and the exercise was to design the, the, this text here to a grid. And that's, that's pretty simple to do in tools like Adobe Illustrator. You can turn on and off those grids and you, you, can, you can see that grid. The grid doesn't necessarily mean that things are in a straight line, though. So it's not, it's not just about vertical and horizontal placement, for example. This text is also designed to a grid, uh, and we can see that, and it, and it has a great layout. What I want to talk to you today about, though, is how we bring that to a dashboard. This example here is on Tableau Public. It's a, a visualization by Rob Bradburn, one of the Tableau Zen masters. And this visualization is designed to a grid. Now, I don't know or think that, that Rob actually laid a grid on top of this and moved things around to align them to a grid, but a grid certainly lays over top of a visualization like this. When we look at dashboards, the same thing can apply. This is clearly a grid with uh, three rows, a row for each goal. Uh, this is a wireless dashboard done by Dundas Software that's featured in the book. And goal one is row one, and goal two is row two, and so on. And so we have these three distinct rows in four columns with a, with a beautiful grid design. On the right-hand side, an executive summary that goes down the page. Here's another example from the book. This is uh, done by Jonathan Drummy when he was with Southern Maine Healthcare. This one is also designed to a grid. We can see the sort of two columns, uh, three row setup, and we have the gray uh, boxes that, that sort of outline where those grids are lined up in the dashboard. This one is completely a grid and it shows the grid. It has the headers and it has uh, you know row headers and, and column uh, lines. Uh, th this is designed to be on a large screen dashboard. This is a call center dashboard and it, it's supposed to be on a large TV screen in the call center. You'll look up at the TV screen and things need to be in clear locations that we can look at. We can see that calls are coming in, uh, what the inbound calls are and, and so on. In the top right hand corner, you'll see that it refreshes every few minutes and in the bottom, uh, there's a scroll bar that goes across um, but the, the grid design here is, is really apparent, you know, with four columns and, and three rows. In classic dashboard training, it's often talked about four quadrants. Uh, this is a dashboard from Stephen Pugh's Information Dashboard Design Book, and it's a CIO dashboard. And in, in that dashboard design, we talk about the top left-hand corner being the most emphasis, the most important piece of information, the bottom right-hand corner as your least amount of information. And if we look at that dashboard, it fits perfectly into that. We can see that major system availability in the top left-hand corner is the most important thing. If you're the CIO, you wanna make sure that your systems are running, your ERP or your data warehouse. And so you want, you, you want to know those things right away. What I want to talk about, though, is that that grid design can be 
overridden in a way. In graphic design, a, a good graphic designer will tell you that they can make you look anywhere that they want to make you look, that by putting a big red shiny object in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, we can make you look in the bottom right-hand corner. Andy's going to talk about that a little later in, in this webinar and show you some, some neat eye tracking that uh, Tableau is doing research on. Uh, but this is, a, this is dashboard here. Another example from our book is an example of where in the bottom right-hand corner uh, that map with all of the dots tends to pull the eye. Uh, and so we get a, a balanced dashboard in this case where the most important information is in the top left-hand corner, uh, but it can create a very balanced look through that dashboard. And so with that, I would like to pass this over to Steve. Okay, Jeff, if you could mind if you would mind passing the ball over to me, I would be grateful. Thank you so much. So want to discuss another common element. Um, Avoid clutter. There are, in many of the dashboards that we were reviewing and working on, and our own dashboards, um, the things would conspire to make things harder to be able to understand and decipher. So I'm going to show you an example of not a dashboard, but an act, just a simple visualization that I saw out in the wild not that long ago. And, uh, well, um, this is our first screaming cat of the day. Um, in preparing the book, we realized some people would uh, use it as a reference guide. They would not start at the beginning and work through the whole thing. They might open to a particular page. And most of the examples in the book are things we think you should emulate. As Jeff said, you should steal like an artist. Well, there are cases where um, um, we have examples of things to avoid, and we wanted to make it abundantly clear that don't make a chart like this. So here we have something which is incredibly difficult to decipher. If you're just interested in knowing, well, how is a particular product group doing, let's say copiers and faxes, this would be in, almost impossible to parse. So what you can do is make it considerably easier by muting the things that are of less interest and focusing on the things that you think are more important. And lest you think um, any of us were just born great at this stuff, I'm going to share an example of my own work from roughly 10 years ago. I've been using Tableau now for 11 years. I should be way better at it than I, in fact, am. And this is one of my first forays into visualizing survey data. And this is very, very difficult to parse. And, and I'm trying to show the frequency of use of certain learning modalities, comparing uh, international versus use versus USA and Canada. And this absolutely gets a screaming cat. And it is, was through help, encouragement, guidance, reading really good books, Stephen Few, Alberto Cairo, um, um, Cole Nussbaumer, and I hope our book will become one of those, getting my ass kicked a little bit, and a very strong community of very good people helping me get better, and that's what I think we're trying to accomplish here. Um, I've now moved from that to a visualization that I think makes what I'm trying to get across much, much clearer. And in fact, I stole, borrowed, but I'm giving proper attribution to Jeff, it was one of the dashboards he created that I used as a model for trying to show this same thing. Let me give you an example of some dashboards that are a little bit um, cluttered. Here was a first cut of a dashboard that did eventually make it into the book from Co-Enterprise. It's a workers' compensation dashboard, and it has so much stuff on it. It's all important stuff, but this is just overwhelming. You don't know where to begin. And here's what it, and yes, it certainly gets the screaming cat. Um, here's what it metamorphosed to over time. And there's still a lot of stuff in here, but it breathes. It's easier to see what's going on. Um, some of the charts were just eliminated. didn't make sense to include them. Um, this is one of my favorites in the book because of the, pick, uh, the, the main chart that we have here. This is an executive sales dashboard. And it's called an executive sales dashboard because it was actually made by the executive for himself. You're usually thinking, oh, the executive doesn't know anything. I have to make a dashboard for him. No, this particular executive did, does absolutely stellar work and which is why some of the elements are a little bit cluttered, this person was able to 
be able to parse it. And I'll discuss later one of my favorite charts, which is a particular type of problem it's solving, and it's solving it so brilliantly. But we showed this, and then we suggested a little makeover on this. Um, one of the things that you may not notice is that the, the labels over here are um, uh, vertically aligned instead of horizontal. It makes it hard to read. And in fact, until um, we looked at this and said, gee, maybe there's a way to make this a little bit clearer, we didn't realize that there were typos in it. Jeff, Jeff found that. So instead of having the filters crammed over here in these elements, Jeff suggested, hey, here's a, a possible way to make this thing breathe. We can make the, the labels of the different columns easier to read and so forth. Again, since the, the dashboard designer and user were one and the same, maybe the clutter, uh, you can get by with it a little bit. One thing that all the dashboards that especially those that are being used by other people need to have is something that is referred to as white space, but I'm going to give you another term for it. Um, here's an example. That is That text is so tightly bunched it's hard to read. If you add white space or what is called negative space, um, the, it, it's not negative space like, gee, I'm trying to make a, um, uh, a design out of um, uh, Jeff did a wonderful job here of showing how you're using the negative space to get the T and the I and the V. Now, in this case, we're referring to negative space as things that just make the dashboard a little more legible. And that's something that you'll see in common, which is, gee, what, do, what can I do to just make it a little easier to parse? And often, it is the introduction of negative space or white space, and we don't mean the background has to be white. It just needs to be able to breathe to make it a little easier. So um, Jeff offered this. This is an, um, an early cut of a dashboard that made it into the book. It is trying to show complaints over time in different regions. It is cluttered. The colors are a little bit harsh, which Jeff will get into in a minute. And it is certainly worthy of a, of a screaming cat. Here's the redesign of it, and there's so many elements in this that, 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 um, that I cite. In fact, when I'm teaching this, when I'm showing people dashboards, I usually start with this one. There's so many wonderful things in it. I'm going to let Jeff um, drill down on some of those things. But the thing in particular is notice the white space, that I'm able to see the different components of the dashboard. They breathe. I didn't have to put rules in or background colors to make the thing stand out. So the other thing of this that I really like is the use of color, and I'm going to let Jeff uh, elaborate on that. So Jeff, I'm going to make you the presenter, and why don't you lead us through color? Thank you, Steve. If I had to pick one thing in data visualization that people get wrong, it's color. I tell my students that uh, you go into a visualization and you think that it's, it's easy. Uh, you want to organize things by color and, and, and show your data by color. Uh, and then they dive into the data, and unfortunately, the data visualization comes out a little looking like that. And uh, it's disorganized, or the color doesn't mean what they think it is, or it's overused color, uh, and it's just kind of having fun with a paintbrush, I guess. Uh, so this is uh, probably my, my favorite page in the book, page 15, is uh, the use of color in data visualization. And it's a bit of a makeover on uh, the traditional way of thinking of color in data visualization. I want to talk about this uh, today. So the three primary ways that you're going to encode data with color, or encode color, uh, the way that you're going to show data with color is um, sequential, diverging, and categorical. And the sequential palette is something that is going to have a quantitative measure to it. It's going to show a range of data. A darker blue is more than a lighter blue. And so the classic example of this would be sales, thinking of something that starts at zero and goes to infinity. 
we don't typically have negative sales. We have no sales, and then we sell a bunch of things. And so this light to dark color is how we encode that uh, with the, how we encode the data. And diverging is a little bit different. Uh, this would be something that has a natural midpoint. And a good example of this might be profit. That's an easy one to think about because a company could lose money, profit could be negative, and profit could be positive. So the natural midpoint in that example is zero. We have orange in this case for losing money and blue for, for making money. The thing is, is it doesn't always have to be zero. The midpoint could be something else. For example, it could be the average unemployment in the United States, and you could see states that are below the average unemployment and you can see states that are above the average unemployment. It could also be something that's more applicable to the business. You could have last year's target or goal for what you want to do. So last year's target maybe or your goal for this year, that's your mid-range and you can see your products that are below their target and products that are above their target. And so that is how we would use a diverging color palette. The categorical, that one is, is pretty simple. That's where we're showing categories of different things. This might be uh, uh, apples, oranges, bananas, pears of a category. It could be something of uh, cars, where you have your SUVs versus your midsize sedans versus your motorcycles and your pickup trucks. The thing that I often see is people try to encode a categorical color scheme with a sequential color palette, and that can get you into trouble. Imagine trying to figure out which color blue represents the minivan and which color blue is the motorcycles. It would be very hard to tell that um, where it's a little easier when it's uh, a lot of contrast between the color hue. Now, these uh, are actually built in, for those of you who use Tableau, these, these color palettes are built into Tableau. They're, they're named slightly different. They call them ordered and ordered diverging and regular, but that's, that's the three palettes, sequential diverging and, and categorical color palettes that are in the, the custom color palettes. We added two which is highlight and alert. And we did that because, you know, highlight and alert, I, I guess, would technically be a categorical comparison of two, you know, categorical colors. But the way that we did it was a way that we wanted to highlight some sort of information. Steve showed an example of lines on a line chart. That's where we have 50 states and we just want to uh, show one state. Or we have uh, 200 countries, we want to show one country and we want to highlight a piece of information. And we would do that with a highlighting color. We do the same thing with alert, and alert still highlights the data, but we do it with a bright, alarming color that's going to grab the reader's attention, something that says, hey, look over here, there's a problem going on, you should probably come check this out. And so that is really the, the difference between alerting and, and highlighting. So let's look at some examples. Uh, for inspiration, again, pulling from things that I'm inspired by personally. Uh, this is uh, Nicholas Felton, who created for 10 years, did uh, the Feltron report. It's a annual report of himself, kind of a 10-year quantified self project, and this was his 2008 uh, Feltron report. And look at the use of color. Very simple, very purposeful. There's white, there's gray, there's yellow. And consider that when we're talking about inspiration of color and design for something like my web analytics dashboard, almost using very similar colors. The gray is a little bit different and the yellow is a little bit different, but very, very similar colors that are used in that dashboard. Uh, this is another example, 2007, where uh, Nicholas Felton was tracking his movements for the year, his subway rides versus his taxis and so on. And the, again, the use of color, very, very purposeful, blue versus the, the dark gray that's almost black. Uh, and we look at that, again, how I'm using color on the course metrics dashboard. Blue outlines something that I'm highlighting, the current course that I'm looking at, my course in data visualization, or whatever professor would pull up their course. And then the gray, the dark gray, shows the, 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 the unit in the college, um, the department, and then we have the college as a light gray. And so we can make those, those comparisons throughout the dashboard. Here's a sentiment dashboard from our book. Again, two colors. This would, I guess, uh, if you did a range of a scale of 10, it could be a diverging color screen going from a darker to a lighter, uh, but really just showing as positive and negative. So two colors, a positive sentiment and a negative sentiment. And then the complaints dashboard that, that Steve showed a minute ago, that has 
uh, really three colors in here. The gray is the sort of the base color, and then we have blue for the, the total number of complaints, and we have this red-orange for uh, the open complaints. And the, the way that we stack the bar chart here, showing the open complaints on the bottom so that I can make a precise comparison on the most important piece of information, which is the open complaints as a percentage of all of my complaints, and the consistent use of color throughout that chart even building the color legend into the title at the top. And this one was done by uh, Matt Chambers, uh, another dashboard in our book. This is looking at the impact of minimum wage on a company. If the state proposes a, a different minimum wage, what that would look like. Again, look at the simple use of color with the blue and the gray to highlight below and above and consistent throughout the dashboard. The last topic of color I want to hit on is uh, color vision deficiency. We, we typically refer to that as someone who's colorblind, and we devote a lot of time in the book about this because this is an important issue. Uh, typically, we'll see the use of traffic light colors, stoplight colors, and these are built into many of the software platforms, and it's a primary problem. The, the, the biggest issue, it's, it's mostly a problem with men, up to about 10% of men are colorblind, and we can see in this simulation here a dark red over on the left-hand side uh, versus uh, the uh, dark green on the, on the right, you, it's hard to tell. You can't tell the difference between the dark red and the dark green, something really bad and, and, and really good. This is a real report that was in my company many, many years ago. And our chief operating officer wanted everything in traffic light colors. That was just something that he wanted all of our reports to show the, the traditional traffic light colors. So this would certainly get a screaming cat because it would be very difficult in this instance to tell the difference between one or the other. This is a colorblind friendly palette, blue versus orange, taken from uh, very similar to the, the Tableau palette. Tableau has a built-in colorblind friendly palette, and blue is a good color for someone who is colorblind. It's, it's a generally very easy for somebody to see the difference in blue. So this same chart simulated, we can see now the difference between that dark orange and the, the dark blue. Uh, it's a little easier to see for somebody who has color vision deficiency. The problem is, is that it's not just red and green, and so this is what we outline in the book. We show here a brown for furniture, an orange for office supply, and a green for technology. There's no red here, um, so it really would be more correct to say avoid red, brown, green, and orange together, right? And simulated on the right-hand side, we can see that that is very, very difficult to, to tell the difference. Again, that would get the screaming cat. Even beyond that, here we have uh, colors that I, I picked very carefully where it has a purple and a gray and sort of a pink red. Uh, and the blue, you can kind of tell the difference with the blue, but even the blue has a little bit of gray in there making it a little more difficult. And so we can really get into trouble with colors uh, without, without simulating color vision deficiency. So with that, we have some palettes that we provided in the book. This is the traditional traffic light color palette. Now, one way we talk about in the book that you could accommodate, you're forced to use red and green, you could have some other accommodation. You could have an arrow going up or an arrow going down, an icon or something. Um, but in some instances, you don't have that ability. So what else you can do is you can make the use of dark and light colors. It can be really dark red and a really light green or vice versa. In this case, we, we darken the red, we light lighten the green, and in the bottom when we simulate that for color vision deficiency, we can really see the difference between the darker color and the lighter color, and the contrast would be apparent. Another trick we can do is we can put a little blue into the green. If it doesn't have to be a true green, we can just add a little bit of blue to it. And when we add a little bit of blue, it makes that contrast a little bit more. It puts a little more gray into that, that tone of that color away from the brown. And so now here we have a dark red with a light blue, bluish green uh, color. And as an example, the stacked bar, for example, what you might use on the complaints dashboard, that would there's nothing that's going to be worse than that a, a you know a pie chart maybe or a stack bar or those scatter plots where you can't tell the difference between the color when we use the colors that we outline with a little bit of blue in there we can see that that uh that difference can really be had here we can see the darker color on the simulation on the right hand side versus the lighter color on top of it um, making it accessible for somebody with cvd and with that i'm going to turn it over to andy Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Jeff, if you could pass the presentable to me. 
I will share my screen. I'm going to talk about typography and bands, which I shall explain in a moment. And some of you have already asked some questions about fonts and things like that, so I'll hopefully address that in this section. All right, so I want to talk about font contrast and bounce. When designing dashboards, what we've discovered over the course of writing the book and over the years is the actual font family itself is possibly less important than consistent hierarchy of fonts across your dashboard. One of the examples we've seen plenty of already is the course metrics dashboard. If we abstract that from a font design point of view, you can see we had a top, mid, and low level font, along with a different uh, color scheme to highlight the data. Seeing that in the course metrics dashboard makes that hierarchy really clear. The other thing to note here is the highest level of the hierarchy is obviously the biggest numbers, course metrics and the bands. But we use color to emphasize which level of that hierarchy you think is the most vital to look at. In this case, it's the titles for the different sections. In terms of which font do we recommend, I, I think as so long as you use a easy to read font family, you will be good to go. Uh, Tableau, we, at Tableau, we developed our own font, which we released in version 10, and that was a font designed specifically and optimized specifically for data visualization. So, I guess I would recommend that font. Jeff talks at great length about stealing like an artist and being inspired. Going back to Feltron, this is the 2008 report, and you can see this three-level hierarchy, three hierarchy of fonts uh, here. Very deliberate choice to use these fonts. Now, personally, I think those fonts are a little bit tall and thin for my liking, but that's not a problem. He made this as a deliberate design choice. And you should be making, co making conscious choices in your dashboards accordingly. We've also looked at the complaints dashboard in quite a lot of detail. Something we are highlighting here, and we'll see again in a moment, is first of all these bands, which I'll come on to in a second, but also you can encode color in your font, such as we've done here, that open complaints are the red color or the sort of sandy pink color and that's repeated in the chart and across the dashboard itself. Doing this removes the need for you to put a color legend and find space for a color legend on your chart because you're encoding that data in, in various different ways. This dashboard also has bands, or as we like to call them, big, angry numbers. Something that we've seen as a really good trend in dashboards is calling out the most important values in single numbers. You see it in course metrics. And here's another example from the book. This is uh, an agency utilization dashboard. Imagine you're a CFO at, at a company uh, hiring out consultants. You want to bill your consultants hours at, at the maximum possible rate each month. Anytime they're not being billed, that is potential billable hours. And if, if they're not being billed, billed then that's uh, revenue lost. This dashboard shows a summary of potential versus build hours for a, a, an organization like this. And it has these bands across the top. You can also see the color legend is embedded in the bands and across the dashboard. Uh, oops. For example, the $3.4 million potential is green, and that green follows right across the dashboard. So bands we think are fascinating. And I've been extremely lucky to work in the last six to eight months with the Tableau research team uh, using eye tracking uh, experiments. And we're looking at where people look when they look at dashboards. Specifically, we're looking at layout, but also how do big numbers influence where people look at in dashboards. This, uh, this research was inspired by uh, some of the famous user eye tracking studies on Google searches and news, news pages, revealing the classic F pattern or Z pattern. Can bands on dashboards influence those things? So what I'm going to share with you is some of the results of the eye tracking uh, experiments we've been doing, just because what we're beginning to see is uh, bands in particular and layout does influence where people's eyes are drawn when they look at a dashboard. So here's the CTC wireless dashboard we showed earlier. Very strong grid layout, but also really prominent bands. And if we show this dashboard to hundreds of people, we get results like this. 
This is called an opacity map. And as the areas of the dashboard are revealed, you'll see where most people look at when they look at the dashboard. Now, in this example, you can see a very strong F pattern. We don't know yet whether that's entirely directed by the grid or the bands themselves. I'll come on to something a little bit more. I'll, 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 I will elaborate a little bit more on that in a moment. But what you can see in, the, in this case is those uh, bands in the bottom center do attract people's eyes, which is kind of breaking the F pattern. And we think it's because those numbers draw people's eyes to the dashboard. Here's the agency utilization dashboard. And when we run that through an eye tracker, you can see the bands really pull people's eyes to them. So let me be clear, eye tracking is uh, it's, it's fascinating research. All we're doing, though, we are not, it is seeing where people look. Right? Now, if you use this dashboard every single week, then you would eventually know where to look to get the answer to your question. But what we're trying to test here is what have you got to give this dashboard to an executive and they've only got 10, 15 seconds to understand the most important information. Again, the bands across the top pull people's eyes, but look down in the bottom right. For some reason we haven't yet uh, determined, the area chart is an attractor of people's eyes. Is it the area? Is it the label? Is it the green? We, we do not know yet. No, we're continuing our research to try and find these answers. So after our initial research, we thought, well, we want to explore these bands a little bit more. What happens if we change them? Can we influence where people look by changing color, by changing size, or by changing location? The first change we made was to the CTC wireless dashboard, and we turned the red number in the top left to green. What you can see here is it didn't really influence the results. We are pretty sure that the grid layout is so strong in this, it's determining an F pattern output. However, when we took the agency utilization dashboard, we thought, well, what if we move the bands to the bottom? If we move the bands to the bottom, what happens there? And here the results are a bit more stark or a bit more obvious. People's eyes were not really drawn to the numbers. Now, as the time develops, you can see by the sort of 10 second, they do begin to look at the numbers, but moving the eyes to the bottom of the dashboard is certainly not a guaranteed way of dragging people's attention to important stuff down there. And the final one I'll show you is uh, from the workers' compensation dashboard. We saw this briefly during the uh, Clutter section. On the left is the original version, and you notice the numbers, they're not that big. There's three numbers in the center. And on the right, but on the right for the second version of the study, we made those numbers a lot bigger. And what happened was this. I love the results of this because the first thing it shows is that if you put a picture of a person that is flesh colored and therefore ooh, potentially naked anywhere on a dashboard, people are going to look at it. Uh, I don't recommend you just put pictures of people on your dashboards without need, but clearly that's pulling people's eyes to the right. But look at the center, look at the bands. When we made them bigger, people did look at them. So when we're considering how to look at how to lay out dashboards and use typography and font, our early research is indicating that uh, position and size of big numbers is really important. And if that, if you can condense information out of your dashboard into something really, uh, you know, those those one those few numbers that, that your audience needs to see and understand very very quickly, then we can use bands to do that. And we will be doing a lot more research on this throughout the year, hopefully publishing results uh, on the Tableau website and doing sessions at our conference in Las Vegas. So we'd love to be able to keep sharing those results with you. So that was uh, typography and bands. And with that, I'm going to hand back over to Steve, who's going to bring it all together. Over to you, Steve. Okay. Andy, if you could just pass the the ball of mirth over to me so that I can share my screen. I would be grateful. Thank you so much. And let me do so. So I want to discuss how we put you know, how you put all this stuff together, but in particular the context of the book. There are three sections of the book. The main part of the book is 
um, if you have this problem, here is a possible solution for it. There are 28 different business scenarios or predicaments or issues that you may face, and if you have something like this, here's a way that you might be able to solve the problem. And what we're going to see how all these elements of design and forethought uh, and, and most importantly, the combination of charts working together help explain or clarify the data that's driving things. So uh, here is the course metrics dashboard. Let me briefly explain the scenario, and that is how do I show people how they compare with an aggregate of other people? In this case, the goal is to show an individual professor how he or she is performing versus other people in the same department and the college as a whole. And you'll notice this little connected dot plot showing, well, here's this group and here's this other group or here's this individual. And in, in this case, um, uh, the blue dot is the individual and the gray dot over here is represented by the, the, the rest of the department. Um, I showed that before in, with the survey data comparing USA and Canada with international. So um, use of white space, use of bands, sparing use of color, but most importantly, hey, this is a really compelling way to show how an individual is doing uh, versus an aggregate. Um, what happens if you actually have all the other individual scores? This is similar to this example, but I'm allowing an individual, in this case a particular speaker, to see how was my session rated across overall content, speaker presentation, and relevance with other speakers. And if I were speaker number 317, I'd feel pretty good about myself because I'd see, wow, look at my dot and look at all these other, other dots. And it gives me a sense of just how many dots there are and where they're clustering. I'm showing a median and showing a 25th percentile and 75th percentile here. Realize this can be used to, to really change people's behavior for, for more important things than gee, just how good was, how well was the session rated? A major healthcare concern would create a visualization like this to show organizations, here is how you are doing with respect to screening employees for diabetes compared to other organizations. And, and, and if an organization sees that their dot is in the bottom quartile and they had thought they were doing really well by their employees, it changes behavior. We'll also offer different examples. So this is a very simple visualization. There's really only one chart, which is this, this jitter plot, um, um, a scatter plot um, or a strip plot that's been jittered, though there are some um, not really quite bands along the bottom. But someone would say, well, wait a second. Were all the sessions had the same number of attendees? So we'd offer another version of this, which is the size of the dots depend on how many people responded. Or in that case of that diabetes screening, it might be, well, uh, I want to see, was that a large organization or a small organization? In this case, a lot of people thought, gee, this looks too much like champagne bubbles, and they find it a little distracting. So here's another example. This is called a unit histogram where you can see where things stack up. And here's your dot versus other dots. Um, it doesn't scale to thousand of dots. It works well in this particular situation. But notice we're only using three colors. You know, the, the title is one color, and then we're just using gray and blue. Um, great example of what happens when you have a boatload of different metrics that you're trying to show. And this is uh, something that we feature from the Financial Times. Um, it is showing uh, economy at a glance for a number of different economies. You can choose China, Japan, UK, United States, and this is one of many different collections of cards that scroll. Notice the use of bands along the left, um, simple charts, lots of white space or negative space, and great use. They figured out, gee, how are we going to present this on a phone, how are we going to present it on a tablet? And on a phone, there's going to be a lot of scrolling, but you're not going to show four different cards at a time. You're only going to show two. On a tablet, you can fit the cards, but they're going to have to be rearranged. But again, um, use of fonts, hierarchy, uh, negative space, uh, chart types, and how do these things conspire to present the data very clearly. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples in the book because it was um, collaboration at its best. 
This is um, an attempt, and I think a successful attempt, though I'd argue you're going to have to train people and understand how the chart works to show sus subscriber churn. So how many new subscribers did we get this month? How many did we lose? Um, it could work for human resources as well. How many employees joined the organization? How many left? Where did they, did they leave more from certain departments or certain divisions? And by collaboration at its best, it was seeking feedback from the stakeholders, my fellow authors, people looking at it. Do you understand what I'm trying to show here? Is it giving you what you need? And again, these things don't come out of, of somebody's head fully born. You need to get feedback on these things. You need to meet with your audience. And just to, to give you an example, um, uh, here was an early attempt at this which is, oh, you know, maybe what we'll show here is the gray will be um, subscribers coming in and the red is losing subscribers and I'll superimpose it and so that we can see, um, uh, hey, I can see where the things are getting spiky in certain months and that's where we're losing more people than we're gaining. Ultimately, this was rejected. Only a handful of people really got it. Um, they found the chart a little bit distracting and a little bit, you know, looks like, people in hoods gathered around a fire. So, but you try these things and you get feedback on it. Early on, at least we realized we need to minimize the colors. And this is gonna segue into something Andy's gonna talk about. This is this HC utilization roll up. It is for um, marketing and ad agencies that are trying to get a better sense of, are they, are they billing, are they uh, achieving what they could be achieving if the organization were well run. And the reason I like this one so much was it distilled or it copied, stole from other dashboards in the book. This is either the last or second to last dashboard to make it into the book. And we use the book to make this dashboard. So the stacked bar charts that you see, well, they came right from the complaints dashboard. And the use of bands along the top, both the, the conversation starters, you know, the biggest, most important thing in this thing that we want to get across is this is how much money you're making. This how, is how much money you could be making if you got your act together. And if you understand blue and you understand green at this point, you can now uh, probably understand the dashboard. And so with that, I'm going to um, pass control over to Andy and discuss how you can use these things and use the things in the dashboard um, to create your uh, in the dashboard book to create your own dashboard. So, Andy, let me make you the presenter. And there you go. Thank you, Steve. Okay, well, while I'm waiting for the presentable to come to me, I'd uh, just like to say thank you for all the questions you have given us so far. Uh, far too many for us to address in the next 12 minutes. I'm gonna, I'll probably hurry through my last section. Uh, but we'll try and get through as many as we can in this presentation, and I'm wondering maybe Steve, Jeff, and I will work on a blog post to answer every single one of the questions you've given to us. <laughs> Nothing like giving us more work to do. All right, we've put it all together. You've made an uncluttered, beautiful, grid-based, amazing color chart with the right balance of fonts. Oh, it's gorgeous. That is one, 45 minutes of the essence of what's in the book. As Jeff said at the top, we want you, we want, we wrote this book so that people could steal like an artist. Take inspiring ideas from other people and rework them into your own organization. The one example we really like and I love it is this one. Uh, this is by Andy Kirk from Visualizing Data and it's one of the scenarios in the book. It shows uh, player metrics for, for an English Premier League player. The player gets this dashboard, each player in the team gets this dashboard a couple of days after a match, and the yellow dot shows this match performance, the red shows the last five match performances, and grey shows the rest of the season. It's a great dashboard, it's really exciting, a really nice application. Well, maybe you're in manufacturing and thinking, well, what has English Premier League got to do with my data? Well, lots, because if you boil this and the other scenarios in the book down, you're actually getting very generic uh, uh, concepts. In this case, this is comparing one thing to multiple others. So whether the dashboard is about sport or healthcare or retail or hotel management, the ideas should be things you can enjoy. 
as Steve said, you've got 28 real world scenarios in here, uh, ideas, oh, just, well, well we, we're just extremely proud of um, the work of others that we managed to include in the book. And we're already seeing the book being used in the, in the way we kind of intended. We wanted this book to be something that sits on a desk and becomes dog-eared and has lots of post-its and the ideas in the book being reused for other people's work. So for example, you know, we're, we're humbled that Curtis, Kate and Donna have already taken some of the ideas and put that into their own work together. So with that, we looked at uh, six different concepts. Grid, clutter, colour, fonts, putting it together and feeling like an artist. We hope that distillation of a 400 page book has uh, given you something you can work with. If you do want to get more, then obviously you can go and get the book. It's available on Amazon, um, wherever you are. We'd be delighted, that would be a great honour if you chose to go and get the book. But with that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody very much and we'll now move into questions. Uh, so Steve and Jeff, are you ready for questions? I have, uh, well, 34 already. If you want, <laughs> uh, if people want to add more questions, they can put them in the Q&A window. We will try and get to them. So the first one I'll start with, uh, is the Big Book of Dashboards available to purchase? Yes, it's on Amazon. Uh, will the webinar be available for later viewing? Yes, we will share the link to this um, when, 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 it, when it's finished. And uh, da, 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 da. Kathleen asked, oh no, Rami, Rami, in fact a few people asked, how many items or elements would you recommend putting on a dashboard? So I'll throw that one open to Steve or Jeff, uh, if one of you want to take that. How many elements items or elements would you recommend on a dashboard? Yeah, I don't, this is Jeff, I don't, I don't think there's a fixed number and I think from the examples that you'll see, you saw elements that had, you know, four charts or four major, you know, the quadrant design that we discussed earlier, but then you saw uh, three columns and four rows and you saw the, the one that Steve referred to as the, uh, you know, the kitchen sink dashboard that just had far uh, many more elements in the dashboard, I think what you have to do when you're done is step back and, and as somebody brought, thank you for bringing that up, you know, you look at that example and say, okay, what is needed in the business? What are we trying to do? How much of it can we fit on a single screen? And maybe you need two different dashboards. Maybe maybe you need to separate it and ask some of the other questions, but uh, most of those questions from that original dashboard uh, in this example, we, we only dropped uh, one or two charts uh, from the original dashboard. Uh, then in the next example, go to the next slide. Uh, in the next example, we have uh, we didn't change any elements. Every single element in from this version to the next slide uh, are we just move things around. We didn't drop anything. We didn't get rid of you know. There's no no chart that we got rid of. We didn't add anything. It's just moving things around in position. So there's lots of things I think we can do without um, without counting elements necessarily. Jeff, I just want to amplify one thing with that, which is also a common thing is, oh my gosh, my screen is small and there's all this stuff that I want to impart. How am I going to do that? With the use of bands or putting the color in the title is one thing which is, hey, you know, I can, you know, one possible improvement to the dashboard that's on the screen right now is instead of having that color legend, which really isn't taking up a lot of room, it's kind of right in the middle of the chart and that's well done, is maybe you incorporate that um, as part of the title and explain, oh, we are comparing current with previous, with this quarter previously, and, and the fonts are a different color, and that's another way to handle it. Yeah. Uh, I, Steve just hinted at something that the three of us have experienced, I think, in writing the book is, and, and we talk about this in one of the chapters, is that dashboards never, that it's, you're never finished with a dashboard. You know, questions evolve, design tastes evolve, and your own perception of what you're looking at evolves. And I think, you know, what Steve implied there is, over time, we looked at this and we, we would continue iterating with all of these if we could continue to, but the Wiley did ask for a deadline. They did give us a deadline, so we had to freeze these dashboards at the point you got them. Uh, Mark Edwards, you asked, I'm fascinated to know, why did you choose a square orientation for the book? Uh, and uh, uh, Steve? Do you want to answer that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I will take that. You know, we we were stealing like an artist. You know that that I really loved um, uh, some books from Nancy Duarte, um, and just thought, gee, this is a, a, a 
good balance. The stuff is laid out. We wanted to be large enough so that you could really see the, you know, you could have the full dashboard on one side and then some commentary on the other side. So part of it was looking at books that we admired and thought imported visualization aesthetics really well. And we said to Wiley, see that book? We want our book to look like that book or the layout of, of that book to emulate that because we found it to be a very pleasant experience in working with that book. So that was the motivation for me. All right, excellent. Uh, okay, uh, Jose or Jose Sierra asks, how long would you recommend or how long usually does it take to design and develop a dashboard? What would be the starting point? Oh. <laughs> yeah, do you want to... We could do an entire webinar on just that question. <laughs> that they, absolutely, yeah. I, you know, every one of I, I think all of the scenarios came from different places. So in some instances, you might have an existing dashboard in your organization, and that's the starting point. You have to go back and ask yourself, is it answering the right questions? Is it doing what we need to do? Are there things that we can do to it to answer the question better and get better insight? If we're starting from scratch, uh, I, I would say you, you got to get to the, the subject matter experts, get to the SMEs, figure out who is the user of the dashboard we talk about the the different the different users a bit in the book is it an executive who's going to look at it from a top level or is it somebody who is down in the organization who needs the detail uh, more than just a summary and so you really need to figure out at who's the audience what's the message that you're trying to relay on that dashboard and really uh, start uh, working it from that direction what are the KPIs that you're measuring that you need to monitor uh, or to understand in the organization so there is a lot to that uh, that's great. Uh, okay, I'm just going to take a couple more of some of the sort of administration e style questions. Uh, a bunch of people have asked about is there, is there how to in the book and can we download the dashboards and are they all done in Tableau or not? Uh, so this is a page on our website, bigbookofdashboards.com slash dashboards. We are making as many of these downloadable as possible. Uh, currently, we've got nine available. We'll be adding a few more as we uh, anonymize some of the data sources. Uh, we have it, the book is not a how-to. What we've done is said so these are designs and chart types and layouts that work, but we wanted to keep it tool agnostic. And in fact, with that of the 28 scenarios, 21 were built in Tableau. Some of them were built in Dundas, and some of them appeared on the web. Uh, if you do want to know how-tos how to build some of these things. The three of us have written many blogs on a lot of their techniques. And there is a, as many of you know, there is a very thriving Tableau community blogging about how to do these, make these solutions. So there's, I think I, I'd be surprised if there isn't a blog about any one of the concepts we've put into the book. Uh, okay, uh, we have two more and, minutes. Andy, did you mention what yeah. the URL is for that? It's just bigbookofdashboards.com. Bigbookofdashboards.com, and that gets you to the homepage uh, and a link to, well, links to lots of other cool things. Uh, Comfort Ajoku asks, are there any geographic data visualizations in the book? Uh, I don't have the metrics. I think there's about five or six, maybe seven dashboards with maps on them. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, somebody also asked about the hex map. How do you make these? This is uh, a hex map and the prime person who blog post about that is um, Matt Chambers who did a great blog post about that uh, which we'll share a link to. Right, I think we are just about done with questions. So we have less than a minute left. Um, Thank you everybody for attending. You know, this is this is we're just bowled over by how many people registered and attended the webinar today. We hope we've managed to distill 30 years worth of data visualization experience into something that's been valued for 45 minutes. It was a great honor and pleasure for me to work with Steve and Jeff, and a great experience writing a book. I highly recommend if you think there's a book in your head, go ahead and write it. Honestly, it's a tough but very rewarding experience. And with that, I would like to thank Steve and Jeff uh, for joining us and for the team at Tableau uh, for hosting this session. The lottery, oh yes, don't forget, everyone who attended this webinar, you are now entered. You don't have to do anything else. You are entered into the lottery and we will be picking 15 lucky winners. We will only send the email notifying those who win the book. So if you don't hear from us in a, in a week, we're sorry, 
you didn't get lucky this time. With that, wherever you are in the world, we hope you have a fantastic day and we will see you all on the blogosphere or on the next webinar or at Tableau Conference, wherever. Okay, thank you.